Hello. You are the director of the National Crime Prevention. Executive director of National Crime Prevention Council. Yes. Can you it's tell a mouthful. Us, it is a mouthful. Can you tell us what that is and what that what you guys do? Sure. Well, the National Crime Prevention Council is best known for our mascot, McGruff the Crime Dog, who has for more than two generations has helped keep Americans safe, basically. Um, he, uh, McGruff, helps educate and empowers people so that everyone has the ability and we li like to instill the knowledge so that everybody can help take a bite out of crime. Yeah. That everyone has the power within themselves and that too often we make the mistake of thinking, well, preventing crime is the police department's job. It's not my job. It's everybody's job. And that's what we do. I love that. And I, as a kid, grew up with, you know, that symbol. So I actually know exactly who you guys are. Um, and I know you guys recently, the organization recently held a summit um, last month around fentanyl awareness. Can you tell me a little bit more about what that, the purpose of that summit was? Absolutely. Uh, fentanyl and the sale of fentanyl, how it's being sold, how people are, how drug dealers are part of international cartels and trying to addict people is just downright scary. Yeah. Um, the National Crime Prevention Council listens very carefully and has a long track record of listening very carefully to parents and family members of children suffering and struggling through drug problems. And the stories that we heard on fentanyl were just beyond tragic. And we wanted to do something about it. And so the summit was an attempt to bring together the variety of government agencies who are working on this issue together with parents and family and community members who have been personally faced by this tragedy and to start the dialogue to help build solutions. I think one of the things we realized is that if anybody tells you they know how to fix the fentanyl problem, they are kidding themselves and lying to you. And that um, it, it is a tough one. It has multiple layers to it and it is not going to be simple to fix, but we do think it's very solvable. Okay. Unlike the broader question of how do we tackle drug addiction, the question of how do we prevent fentanyl deaths, I think, is, is uh, much more solvable if we pull together and focus on it as a problem that can be solved. I agree. I agree. I've, um, you know, as a mother of two boys, I, I always look for solutions. So my, my goal is always to find a solution. I want to hear success stories. I want to know how to fix the actual problem and not just put a band-aid over something. So can you tell me um, kind of the response from government and, and you know, the senators or congressmen who showed up at the actual? Uh... Sure. Well, we had um, three government agencies that are largely responsible for the efforts around um, protecting us from uh, fentanyl. We had um, folks from the Drug Enforcement Administration, who I think people are aware of as the chief enforcement um, yeah. uh, administrator. And we had someone from Homeland Security. And Homeland Security, um, there is a big international component to the drug cartels, to the importing of fentanyl, and the use and sale of fentanyl on social media sites. Yes. And then we also had uh, someone from the United States Patent and Trademark Office because their job is to protect the patents and trademarks on what are real pills and real medicine and fentanyl is being put in things that are fake pills that are being sold as the real thing, be it an ADHD medication, an antidepressant, or a pain reliever like Oxycontin, and they're being sold largely to children, yes. teenagers, yes. Um, on social media sites. They think they're buying a pill that is going to help them focus and 
help them get a better chest score is on if they're buying an ADHD pill or a pain reliever because they're suffering from pain and, and uh, want something stronger than Tylenol. And then the reality is um, the pill contains a lethal amount of fentanyl, which a lethal amount of fentanyl is only two milligrams. Right. So to put that in perspective, if you took um, a, a sweetener packet um, and if that were fentanyl, that would be enough fentanyl to kill 500 people. It is, it is, the, most, it is the most lethal um, opioid, synthetic op opioid um, that is available now. And so what happens is the perspective of the drug dealer is fentanyl is cheap. Um, it's cheaper than the other things. Yeah. It also will give the user of it a very addictive effect. That's, and that's so the issue. The, right? the, but, one yeah. of the questions that came up a lot is, well, why is a drug dealer putting this in? If it can kill somebody, won't they lose a customer? Right. They don't care about life and death. They care, what they care about is addicting somebody and making somebody a lifelong customer. And if they feel that that um, pain reliever they're getting from that one particular drug dealer is better than all the other ones they tried because it's not necessarily better, it's more addictive because it has fentanyl in it, um, that they will have a repeat customer. And that's what they're going for. And if somebody dies along the way, you know, it doesn't matter to them. It's just, that it's just about the dollars. But what's the number? I mean, we're at, what is it, 100,000 deaths this year? Or last year? Was it last year? Yes, I mean, last year. And what what number are we at currently? Um, it seems to be about the same now. Um, although the debt, the usage seems to be about the same. The death rate keeps going up. Um, I've heard one statistic, and it's 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 not it's impossible to verify. But for every fifty pills with fentanyl, every fit. For one, uh, every 50 fake pills with fentanyl that are sold, um, one is going to have a lethal dose. I mean, these are manufactured in basements um, in China and other changing? places, yeah, so they are not controlled. So I'm they're sorry? coming from that. That was my question. Uh, they're coming from um, not the U.S. They're not coming from inside the U.S. so much as they are coming from China. And are they crossing the border? They, they, the fentanyl is coming in from China, usually to Mexico. There are two primary cartels in Mexico that are funneling the fentanyl into the U.S. Um, and it comes in the U.S. in many, many different ways. Um, the most common is shipments. It's, uh, it's you know, there, there are fake pills um, snuck inside a container ship. And if, you know, anybody is familiar with the size of a container ship, yeah. it's massive. Right. And if you're talking about something which a lethal dose is only two milligrams, it's very easy to smuggle that. The other very scary thing about it is they're also being shipped. Somebody, you know, hears about it, makes a deal on um, Snapchat or somewhere. Yeah. They Venmo the money and the package arrives FedEx in a day or two. Um, so part of it is, yes, it is a border control issue, but for folks who think, okay, if we just shut down the border with Mexico, we're going to stop it. That's naive. Um, like I, I, I've said, um, fentanyl is a 20th century invention that is being distributed and illegally sold through the most sophisticated 21st century supply chains imaginable. What and and I have two questions actually. Um, one is: Is this happening in other countries? Is this is this primarily a U.S. Uh, situation, or is this happening elsewhere? And then the second one, I will follow up after that. Okay. Um, it unfortunately is largely an American problem, which also leads to what I said early on: is I think this is a problem we can solve. Okay. And then now I forgot my second question. <laughs> That's all right. I, I had this. Do it all the time. <laughs> right there. So sorry. Um, 
So my, you know, there's been a lot of talk and maybe it's conspiracy, maybe it's just hearsay, but there was this idea that was kind of put in front of me about how we kind of created an opioid crisis in China back when we started growing the poppy seed uh, there. Um, and they started to have major issues back in, I don't know if it's the 1940s or 1950s, I don't even know the exact date that we were doing that. And then is the, then somebody was saying, this is kind of the way they invented to get back and take over and, and harm our youth. Um, so fentanyl is a synthetic, it's manufactured. Mm -hmm. But in terms of what the intent is, in this case, it's very clear. Um, it's money. Uh, drug dealers, international cartels are capitalists who break the law. Um, they want to make as much money as possible. They know that fentanyl is both cheap and highly addictive. So if they put fentanyl in their pills and sell them to primarily young people, they're going to addict a generation of customers. It is purposeful, it is abhorrent, and when these people are caught, uh, they deserve to be in jail for a very, very long time. Right, but is there anything, I mean, how many, how many people from the drug cartel end up being caught, you know? That's, that's, that's part of the problem, that's why we wanna focus attention on it. Yeah. Um, the, the, the short answer is not enough. They, they've done um, ICE, um, and Homeland Security have done a fairly effective job at having ongoing seizures of the product at, at, at ports and, and in other places. Right. Um, but they're having a hard time really getting at the cartels, the, the drug dealers, the kingpins, and getting to them. Uh, we hope that will change. Um, but part of the problem is, too, and this is part of the effort we're working on specifically with the United States Patent and Trademark Office, is the sale of fake products in the U.S. has long been viewed by uh, many Americans as a victimless crime. There's no harm in buying that knockoff handbag or those fake Nikes. They're cheaper, and I still get what looks like the real thing. Right. What that has created is a culture that accepts that. And to the point at which now we're selling lethal pills to kids on Snapchat and other social media sites is the point where we have to say enough. That was that and that, thank you for saying that because that was my question. What is the main site that this is being sold on social media wise? Because that is how we can, that's how, you know, in my family, that's how they came in contact with it was through a social media app. So there, there, is, there aren't reliable data and statistics on this because the social media companies right now won't share that information, which is one thing we're trying to have happen. Um, I do know, and like I said, it's been the National Crime Prevention Council and McGruff's mission for years to talk to family members and parents. I have not heard from one parent who has come forward and said they lost a child through this tragedy, whose child has bought it anywhere other than Snapchat. Okay, thank you for thank you for saying that. I and I should preface this because uh, my, my my child first uh, found it on the black web. So I don't even know about the dark web. I you know right. when, when that information came out, it was more shocking to me than pretty much you know him buying drugs. I, I, I couldn't, I can't even fathom how you get on to the dark the web. The dark web. There yeah. is that source as well, which I, you know, that one, I don't know how to um, have any type of control over government wise, legal wise, rule wise, but Snapchat and Instagram and all of those, I mean, they should truly be held accountable for allowing this type of behavior. I mean, it's it's a sale of a product that's happening or on a in a in something like Snapchat, where you see the you see the person for so many minutes, or you have the conversation, and then everything can be deleted. Yes, the 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 concept of encrypted technology, 
um, disappearing text messages, uh, those kinds of things in the US are considered free speech. Other countries have done a better job of defining free speech versus illegal activity. And I think that's an area where the US can absolutely improve and change our laws. It will require some changes in laws. It will also require a certain amount of social responsibility on the part of the companies. Um, I think that and th that's there is no reason yes. that they should not realize what's going on and take steps on their own. Um, you know, right now, what we're hearing from them is they, they've done some things, but they clearly haven't done enough. Uh, right. It's still happening. Right. Uh, we have to set a standard where this is just simply not acceptable in the United States. Right. No, it's not. And, and it's um, to the point where this is becoming the, the number one killer in the U.S. And, you know, I, I do don't hear as much about it on media and that that's kind of been uh, part kind of, of it come to my attention over the, over just being in the experience of it it's just very interesting how it's not being uh talked about more it needs to be talked about more it needs to be talked um about more um on the national level it needs to be talked about more around the kitchen table when parents have conversations with kids um, toward that end, we're focusing a lot of our efforts on raising awareness and making sure that people who've already lost their lives, that that's not the end of it, and that those lives will matter, and that we'll be able to bring about change. At the summit, we, we announced and launched the Lives Project, which is the creation of a digital quilt where people who've been victims of fentanyl can be remembered so that their lives will have meaning beyond the years that they spent on this earth. And uh, we, we encourage everyone to visit uh, 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 livesproject.org. If you know of a family member or want to memorialize somebody, there is the opportunity to do that. Um, in, in just a couple of weeks since we, we announced it, as, as I said, when we announced it, we knew it would continue to grow. Yeah. Sadly, it has continued to grow. But we want to use that sadness and that tragedy and turn that into action. Uh, and is there um, any support or or um, not to, uh, support, but also you know the rehab facility? It's interesting because the rehab facilities and the AA and NA and all all these different programs that we've had for decades and you know years that have helped not so not just support the addict but the families um have kind of this one this particular drug has been so uh insidious that a lot of those types of normal things that work solutions that work haven't haven't worked um for this specific drug is there is there any um type of a support group that that you're aware of or a rehab facility that you've seen success at or know of you know you, you it's an excellent question because it is different mm -hmm. um it's different because most of the time it's not a fentanyl addiction that is the start of the problem the start of the problem is there might be some experimentation with drugs on the part of a young person, or um, it's an opioid addiction or something else. And then some, somehow fentanyl gets into, is, is what was being illegally sold to them. They don't realize it was fentanyl. So you can't cure an addiction if you don't know what the addiction is, number one. Number two, the very sad, tragic part of it, and we work very closely with one parent who's actually formed an organization, and what happened with her son was he was just at the early stages of experimenting with drugs. They had gotten, in, they had gotten him into a rehab facility. She pleaded with him the night before he was going into rehab not to take anything. The next morning when she went to wake him up, he didn't wake up. And she, the later they discovered he had taken a pill he bought on Snapchat. Um, and it contained a lethal dose of fentanyl. 
So rehab didn't even have a chance. Right. I know. Well, the, it's um, that idea, that addict idea where you get, oh, I this is my last time. I'm, this is my last time. This is my last time. You know, you see that. You see that. And then um, I think the, the issue is even getting into the getting into the rehabs and experiencing what they what they do there their their typical treatments don't work for this specific thing because it's it's a different sort of i don't know if it's a different sort of mechanism in the brain or or what it is but um a lot of times they're throwing other pills at it as well so colonopin xanax something to sleep and those actually have, in my opinion, and in our, our experience, made it worse. So it was a, it was a, it was like, oh, we are coming off of that. Let's, let's throw everything else at you and see what happens. And then you start to, then you, you know, you see the, the person kind of lose it. And so they go right back into using. Um, so, the, and, and that really comes down to, I really want to start to share and, and find hope for people who are addicts and who are been using and for families who have this experience because it's almost like the end game can't, can't just be, oh, you know, your chances are now you are going to possibly overdose and die. Um, right. It's just such a, uh, Yeah. I mean, so that seems so hopeless. And I feel like the youth at this point has, um, everybody I've been talking to and the youth, they, they're really looking for things to be hopeful for, for a future, for a, um, for a beautiful life, for fun and, and joy and not to, not to have so much pressure and, and, and stuff held over them because it's, it's, it, it doesn't give a good, a good outcome. So I'm, I'm, that's kind of, that's what my mission is at this point. Um, good. And we're, we're very delighted that you are taking that on. Our hope is that more people will follow that example and lead and, and take it on. We're, we're, you can't solve a problem if there's not awareness that there is a problem. Right. That's, you know, at a very basic level, you, that's where you have to begin and to let people know that there are solutions, that they are not alone. I think one of the things that we discovered in, in our months of working on this issue is that there are lots and lots of family members who've been affected directly by this issue. Yeah. They felt that no one had been listening and that there was no place to turn. So one of the things that we wanted to do by creating the summit, by creating the Lies Project, is to give them a place to turn. Um, that is important in and of itself, to let people know that they are not alone. And if you look back at other things that we have done a better job at tackling, mm -hmm. they've not always been easy. Getting started is often the hard part. And I drew the analogy to the AIDS movement. In the very early days of it, nobody was listening. Mm -hmm. um, there was denial. Um, there, there was lots of resentment. Um, the medical establishment, doctors, NIH, they weren't doing what they needed to do. Um, and then people just said, no, this is not acceptable. And that, turn, that began turning things around. It became less a partisan issue. Right. It became more bipartisan. More people came to the table. The pharmaceutical companies who were viewed as the evil enemy uh, on the part of AIDS activists at the beginning were ultimately the ones who came up with solutions. And governments worked together across international borders to bring AIDS treatments to countries where they couldn't afford them. And, you know, they're, they're, and that is an issue that globally affected billions of people. Yeah. And now we're talking about a problem that is, for the most part, an American problem that is affecting a large number of people. And sadly, in the course of this half hour, 45 minute conversation, you know, there will be somewhere between six and 10 young people who will die from fentanyl. And we seem to be accepting that right now. It's almost like, oh, 
drug addiction, drug problems have always been with us. And that might be true, but fentanyl is a new problem that has not always been with us. And there are particular reasons why the rate of death has accelerated. Right. The, and, and that's what we can stop. Yeah. And that was the that was another question that I, you know, even before we wrap this up, but um the when did fentanyl actually hit the scene? Because it, it really didn't seem to hit the scene in my awareness until about 2020. So I, I'm sure it was around a little bit before, but I'm not quite positive as what it was used for, um, sure. any of those things. It just kind of all of a sudden appeared. Right. Well, fentanyl was invented in the early 1960s as a legitimate pharmaceutical. It is still used as a legitimate pharmaceutical largely intravenously in hospitals uh, for people who are chronic pain sufferers, for people who are at the end of life in terms of giving them their last few days, some dignity to them. Um, I know Oxycontin, is, right? Oxycontin was the same idea. Oxycontin was the same idea, only they knew, it was known how potent fentanyl was right at its invention. And for years, it had been just synthetically, it had been controlled. A very limited number of pharmaceutical companies um, would sell it under carefully controlled situations directly to hospitals. And it still has a useful purpose in that setting. And, you know, we don't want to take anything away from family members and patients who need legitimate fentanyl so administered in a hospital. But it's the illicit use. And you're right, it's been about... Um, it started popping up right around 2020, 2021. It's accelerated tremendously in the last two years. I came on board in this position about a year ago, and it was just starting to get more and more in the headlines when I took over as executive director. And I started looking into it very early on because it just, there were so many parts of it that were just so abhorrent to hear and then to start taking phone calls from parents who lost a child. We're talking children, 12 years old, 14, 16, people who have their whole lives in front of them ruined right. um, in an instant. Yeah, yeah. And it's, uh, you know, I, I had a, when I, in my youth, I, I knew a lot about Oxycontin. I knew a lot about a lot of pharmaceutical drugs just because that was kind of what was on the scene. Um, in the experimentation era, but, it, but now this, this really seems as though, and I, and I'd been talking earlier with, with actually Brittany, and we were talking about how with Oxycontin, there was there has been massive change just due to them have, being taken to court and sued for their distrib uh, distributing that actual drug uh, for people who didn't need it. Doctors were writing prescriptions for just kind of anyone at at a certain point. So they got they as far as I know they they actually got sued over that, and that has changed the course of oxycotton, which then fentanyl seemed to have taken its place is how my perception on the outside. Um, so what you're alluding to is that even changing the pharmaceuticals use of fentanyl in uh, even hospital settings. So say making it an illegal drug or making it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't change this. No, because there, there, there are two things going on. There, there is legal fentanyl and we're fine with that. You know, it's, it's, it, it's, it's administered in the most controlled of environment imaginable. Um, and it is not, the legal use of fentanyl in hospitals and through doctors, through legitimate prescriptions is not a, is not a problem. Okay. It's the illicit sale of fentanyl put into things, sold as something else to unsuspected people especially unsuspecting youth, that is causing the problem. Got it. So in closing, um, what, how do you see just even this issue moving into 2023? You know, 
are there is are there any uh kind of glimmers of hope or any positive thing you can share about how 2023 could look sure i think um going into 2023 is that there is increased awareness there are an increased number of people who are being involved um so we we launched the lies project um and that will continue to grow that will continue to humanize it and put it in people's faces yeah. so it's it's hard to ignore um we have uh our midterm elections tomorrow um there have been a lot of sound bites during yeah, the campaign right. season that was kind of my question yeah are there any is there anyone who's speaking out about this or taking this initiative on um sadly not in a in not in a way that we would like yet and that's something that we're going to focus on and work on um you know it's been very easy for for politicians to grandstand and make soundbite on it mm -hmm. but soundbites very seldom make real make real solutions yeah uh and i think that's what we're going to do i think what we started with the summit of bringing different government agencies together was just the tip of the iceberg um and what we've um realized is we have three agencies together we need to double that we need right. to have at least six agencies together we right. need this is this has to be an all hands on deck movement and i think one thing we accomplished with the summit was a realization that, that that needs to happen and that that is happening and starting to happen now um even the three agencies we had together realized they didn't communicate enough amongst themselves um, so I do know that um, the uh, Drug Enforcement Administration is scheduling a staff level briefing for everybody, the United States Patent and Trademark Office, so they can share notes and come up with ideas. Yeah. Um, like I said, I, do, I think anybody who says they have a magic wand and know how to fix this today is kidding themselves. Um, but it, the solution is out there. We have to put our minds together. And most importantly, we have to create the national will that says, no, we're not going to tolerate this and it needs to be fixed. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I, I think we have to give more hope and inspiration to our youth that they don't go down this, go down that path. I mean, it, it's, it's almost like for, yes, so all the things you said, but also bringing hope and, um, you know, just like positivity for them to move forward because with their schools shut down and with all the things that kind of happened they really a lot of them really lost track of sight of what their future looked like so it's giving them this positive something positive to look forward to for the future would be my hope as well so they avoid the path of um this yeah this insidious drug so thank you so much for talking to me and um i we i would love to know about your next summit that you guys will help that you are planning to hold hold right <laughs> hold um i would love to be a part of it in some way and just you know start to understand kind of more of what can be done so terrific would, would love to keep you involved thank you for airing this and helping increase attention for your listeners please visit liesproject.org um, there are ways to sign up and get involved there and get more information uh, and it, the only way we're going to solve this is solving it together so thank I, you i agree thank you so much paul